So this is the beginning of a series on serial ports. We're going to be taking apart a lot of devices, uh, uh, network webcams, routers, modems, and other small devices, and getting at the serial ports on them and connecting to see if we can get a shell. Most of these devices are going to be running Linux, and once we get a shell, we can make these devices do a lot more. And today we're going to be looking at the Pogo Plug uh, Mobile. Uh, I've had a standard Pogo Plug for years. I've actually had two of them because uh, I bricked one and then unbricked it using the serial port, which we'll get to in a future video. Um, but they are great little devices, and uh, not being sponsored by them at all. Uh, the first one I bought was years ago. They were 50 or 60 bucks. I spent 75 bucks on mine to get the black model because the standard model was pink and I didn't want a little pink device sitting next to my TV. And then I ended up buying one of the pink ones later on when I thought I, well, when I did brick, but then unbricked my black one. Uh, so what is the Pogo Plug? The Pogo Plug is a little Linux device you buy that you can plug storage into, USB ports. Uh, uh, the standard one has, I think, five USB ports on it. And this one has one USB port and an SD card slot. Uh, so they, you plug them in and right away you now have your own little cloud. You create an account on the Pogo Plug website and you just go ahead and start uploading and sharing your files, but they're all stored in your house locally. Well, over the years, these devices have come down in price. That's kind of why I've bought a few of them. Uh, last couple of years, the standard Pogo plug, uh, which has the four USB ports, is a bit bigger than and is a big bigger than this one, is uh, has been about twenty bucks. Well, the other day, I was looking for some sort of small ARM device, uh, small Linux device that had a Ethernet port on it uh, that was really really low cool cost. I was trying to find something for under ten dollars, um, and devices like. Um, the Raspberry Pi Zero, which is really comes to about 15 bucks currently after you include shipping, doesn't have an Ethernet port. I have a couple of chip computers that are $10 plus shipping, so again about $15, but uh, they don't have Ethernet ports either. So I was just looking for something really low, and uh, I went to Amazon again, and I searched for Pogo Plugs to see what price they were now. Uh, these little mobile ones that uh, have been discontinued by the company were $8, and if I bought two of them, I got two of them for $14 and change, and they also came with a little uh, lens cloth. Why? I don't know, but it was a lens cloth that I can use. Great. So, uh, so I have two of them. I have this one, which is still in a box, and they do make great gifts for non-technical people, because again, they just plug them in and they're ready to go. They're very weak as far as power, but they're so cheap and you can do so much with them. And um, the one that I, I use every day as my server in my other room for years, I installed Debian on. You can also install Arch on them. Um, but today we're going to be looking at getting serial access to them and just messing with the default Linux OS that's on here. So let's go ahead and get started. So again, this is what the uh, Poco Plug Mini looks like. Uh, I've already dismantled this one and taken out the guts, but uh, you have the little Pogo Plug logo on the front and a light here that lights up different colors, which we'll be looking at as well. And on the back, you will have your power plug, Ethernet, USB port, an eject button. I'm not really sure what that's for. My other one doesn't have one of those. And an SD card slot. Now, to take these things apart, there's little foam pads on the bottom. Let me turn this this way. And two of them on the back, if you pop them off, there are screws under there. Take those screws out and then start prying it apart. And uh, I used a flathead screwdriver to pry all the way around. And as you do so, there are little clips uh, around the front and the side that if you just, with a little bit of force but finesse, they just pop right off and you get access to the board inside, which is on this little plate here. I removed it from the plate for now because I had to solder some connections onto it. Now in the description of this video, I'll have a link to all my notes on everything we're going to go over here, uh, as well as all the commands. Uh, but real quick, next to the SD card slot here, you'll have four little pads. Now those pads uh, have ground, transmit, and receive, and a uh, voltage connection there, which we don't use. Uh, and um, I soldered it on there. Normally I try to put pins on boards like this, uh, but the pads were, were filled, so I couldn't do that. So I just soldered wires directly on there, and I'm going to put some hot glue on there eventually to, to hold them down. And I also stripped these wires a lot more than I need to, and I don't want them touching anything, so the hot glue will help with that. Now, to connect to the serial connection, you're going to need a USB to serial connector, unless you have serial ports on your computer still. Um, this is an old school one I've had for years. I never use this one anymore. Um, here is one 
that I got off of eBay for about a buck fifty. It doesn't come with these connectors, uh, but you know it's labeled. It's got its transmit, receive, ground, five volts, and a three volt. Um, but these are great. Uh, but today I'm going to be using a different connect. I'm going to be using a um, T T L. 232R. Uh, it says that here on here. So it's, it's a little bit more, more than a buck fifty of the other one, but you should be able to get it for under ten dollars. It's only a couple dollars. But what's nice about this is it has a nice long cable, very long cable here, and uh, nice color coded uh, wires here. And uh, so it's just easy to plug in where the other one, the USB, all the connectors are right there. So it's really close to the computer. Uh, so this one's real nice, but any of these uh, USB connectors will work. Now again, there's going to be notes in the description of this video going over everything that we're going to go over uh, step by step. Uh, and this board I have already messed with, but I'll go over what I did and show you those changes. But right now I have an SD card slot, an SD card in the card slot there, a uh, USB uh, flash drive in the USB port. I have my Ethernet hooked up here, power, and I'm about to plug it in here. And of course, uh, my serial port connections here. And again, uh, from the SD card, we have uh, the uh, ground, and then I believe it's transmit and receive, but it might receive and transmit. Again, that will be in the notes. Uh, I did, luckily, I did it by accident, but I color coded the wires I put on there appropriately with my serial port connector so I can connect my yellow to my yellow and my red or orange to my orange. So, very easy for me to remember. I did that by accident though. So the first few commands I'm going to run on my laptop here, which I have over by the board just for ease. Uh, so I'll be doing screenshots this way, but once we get the network up and running, uh, I'll be able to move over to uh, my main computer and actually screen record there. Uh, but I'm going to use a program called Screen to connect to my serial port device. There's other programs you can use. That's just what I have chosen to use here. Uh, now, by default on Linux, regular users do not have... Um, permission to access the serial port this way. Uh, so what you would normally do is uh, add a user to the group of, um, I believe it's dial out, and uh, that will be in the notes, again, in the link in the description. But for now, on this little, I'm again running Linux Mint off a USB port here, so it's a fresh install besides the fact that I installed screen, which should be in a repository, so sudo apt install screen. Now we're gonna run um, sudo screen uh, dev TTY USB 0, and we're going to give it a baud weight rate of 115200. Now, make sure your USB port is plugged in, and this uh, might vary depending if you have more than one serial port, but I'm assuming you probably only have one hooked up at a time. Uh, but if you have more than one, it might be TTY USB 1 or 2 or whatever device it is. So, um, once you have the port plugged in, because that device won't show up until you have the USB plug plugged in even if the board's not on because it's basically detecting a chip inside uh, the USB connector here. So I'm going to hit enter and now we have a blank screen that's just waiting. But if I take the power to the board, the pogo plug, and plug it in, we will start getting some stuff on the screen here shortly. There we go. So U-Boot is what's used as a bootloader. Uh, at the very beginning there, I can hit enter to go into U-Boot, and that's used for changing boot options, and you can always, uh, you know, flash it if you mess stuff up. Um, but yeah, so now it's connecting through all this, and at the end, you will get a root prompt. So, here we go. This is what it looks like when you're done. I can hit Control L to clear the screen. But you can see I can list out. I'm on the, the Pogo plug. I can do, um, bring this up here. Again, I know this is hard to read, and I just want to show you working through the USB uh, port here, uh, but I have enabled uh, SSH and Telnet so I can get into it remotely, and we'll move to that in a moment. Uh, but if I do uname-a, you can see that we are running Linux, Pogo Plug Mobile uh, is, the, is their kernel compile. It's actually running a 2.6.31.8 um, kernel, so kind of old. Uh, it was compiled on Tuesday, August 23rd at 1300 hours on 2011. And it is an ARM V5 Tel chip that's running on that's compiled for. Uh, and it's a new Linux kernel. So again, here I am actually telneted in, but let's just pretend I'm still connected through the serial port. And again, everything I'm about to show you, I've already done on this system, so the stuff's already there. But let's just dive in with the first few things you're probably gonna do when you start up the system. Again, uh, if you, you name dash A, you can see that we're running uh, a ARM5, and that's, uh, it's obviously a Linux kernel, a rather old one. 
Now, what partitions? Now, if I do mount, you can see that uh, stuff is mounted, but we really don't know where the stuff is coming from. Like we can see our, our root file system mounted here. It's listed twice. It's a UBI file system. And by default, when you connect to this, this is gonna say RO for read only. So actually, let's, the first thing we wanna do here is let's make this um, rewritable. Again, it's already done on mine, but the command you would run is mount uh, dash O remount comma RW and then forward slash for our root. So go ahead and hit enter. And then when you type out mount again, it should have changed from RO to RW. Let's go ahead and clear the screen there. Now, what partitions do we have? Now, normally you'd go to your dev folder to see all your drives and partitions would be one way. So if we list dev like this, you can see there's a lot of uh, files here, but you see these MTDs and these MTD blocks, which are basically the same thing. So MDT block zero and MTD zero are, are basically the same thing as you'll see here in a moment. I'm gonna go ahead and clear this out because we can see that they, they kind of have partitions, but there's no main device for them like you normally would see SDA, and then the first partition would be SDA1. Uh, so let's get some more information on this. And uh, parted would be an, uh, a command that would normally look for, but that's not installed on this device by default. So let's go ahead and just cat proc partitions, which will list out all our partitions here. And uh, by default, you probably won't see these bottom ones because that's my SD card and my USB port there. And um, they may not be mounted by the default. We're gonna have to do that manually later on. Um, but you can see our different block devices here, our MTD files or devices, partitions. Uh, so let's get a little more information on them. If we cat proc MTD, you can now get some more information on those. And obviously the first one here is your boot, which is our, our bootloader. Again, let's not mess with that partition because if we screw that up, uh, yeah, good luck fixing that. It's beyond my, my knowledge. I mean, I'm saying you can't, uh, but uh, yeah. So then we have UImage and UImage2 and then failsafe. Not really sure what that is, uh, but it sounds like it's a good thing to have. And then you have your root partition there. Uh, so at this point I can um, do something like, so our root partition, is already mounted. So let me just do df-h. And when I do that, you can see our root partition here. Um, again, it doesn't even tell you the device. It says it's UBI0. Uh, you can see that it's almost 100 megabytes, which is great. That's a lot. A lot of devices I do this with are connecting through serial port, you know, our routers, modems, little IoT devices. And they usually have like as low as two megabytes. I've seen on some devices, as you'll see as we go on in the weeks. Uh, and at most, I mean, maybe 32 megabytes, but a lot of them only have like eight or 16 megabytes on them. Uh, so we have 100 megabytes here. The entire uh, flash chip, I believe, is about 128 megabytes. Um, and just our root file system is about 100 of that. Only 11 of it is used, and that's after I've added a few things. So we still have 85 megabytes free. And that's, that's for the main operating system. Uh, and then we can still plug in however much storage we want into the SD card slot or the USB port. So that's great. So let's go ahead and have a little more look at this. Um, and what we can do is we can do fdisk-l and we can point it to um, our, our partition here. So it's gonna tell us that there's no partition table because we're pointing at basically a partition, but dev uh, mtd four for our root partition. And you can see here, it does say it's 117 megabytes uh, altogether. Uh, again, uh, depending on how you count the megabytes, might show a little different there. Anyway, so those are that's a little bit of information on our partitions. Uh, let's move on from there. So we want, really wanna get to the point where we can telnet in or SSH in would be even better, um, but we need to create a root password. And again, we connected through serial port uh, so we don't need a password because we just, we're just dropped to a root shell. Uh, but if we're gonna connect in through a network, we're gonna need a, a password. So let's just go passwd root to change the root password and then type something in. I'm just gonna put in a short password here. It tells me it's too short, but since I'm root, it lets me do it anyway. So now you can uh, tell that in SSH in once you start up those services. Now, the Pogo Plug uh, company does allow you to enable SSH through their web interface. Sometimes, when I got my first one, no problem. I went in there it, under security after creating an account and going to their website and was able to enable SSH. The second Pogo Plug I got, it wasn't there at first, 
I turned it on and off a couple times, plugged in drives, unplugged drives, and finally it showed up. This past one, I couldn't get the, the SSH option to show up in the web interface, and that's why I've gone in through Serial. Now, they have their own little startup script here, and Vi is already installed for a text editor, so I can go uh, Vi etc slash init dot d uh, forward slash RCS. Again, this is all in the notes in the link in the description. And we get here, most of this is unchanged. This is uh, how it was set up, except for a few things I commented out and a few things I added at the bottom. But you can see it's mounting different partitions here, setting up some network stuff. Um, and then down here, this part was already here, this if then statement. And this is the little if then statement that allows them to start up either Telnet or Drop Bear, which is your uh, SSH server. Uh, and I just commented out the if then statement, so starting up both of those. But you can come out one or the other if you just want one or the other. Uh, right now I'm using Telnet uh, because currently when I try to connect to the SSH after enabling it, it's telling me that uh, the keys that I'm using uh, are incompatible with the SSH client that I'm using or something along those, and I haven't looked into it yet. Um, but I have the I have both of them running so I can Telnet in no problem, and that's what I'm doing currently. Uh, there's a few more lines here at the bottom that I added that we'll go over later on. Uh, but this bottom one, I commented out. So let me come out of this file real quick. If you PS, you'll see a lot of uh, processes here, but you'll see a whole lot more than this when you initially connect to this. And that would be all of the Pogo Plug services to connect to their servers and do all the file transfers and stuff. Well, uh, we want to disable that. Uh, well, at least I want to disable that. You can leave that running if you want to still use their services. I'm going to disable that because I just don't need that running. So going back into our startup script, the very last file here, or line here, is starting up this script. And so I commented that out. So next time, if you comment that out, next time you restart it, all their services are stopped. They're no longer connecting to their servers, and you don't have all those processes running. Great. Uh, and uh, for now, uh, let's quickly look at partition stuff. So again, as I said, uh, if I type in mount, whoops, uh, you'll see that I have my SD cards uh, mounted and my USB card, but uh, or USB flash drive. Uh, by default, uh, at least after disabling their services, those things don't get mounted by default. So what we need to do is create those devices, mount them, and add them to our FS tab. So normally, if I come in here and I say list, I can dev and I can do SDA and like this, and you can see all the SDA devices. Well, uh, that's not gonna show up by default after you disable their services. And the same for the SD card. And again, you can name these anything you want. Uh, by default, S SD card should be MMC uh, BLK zero for the device and then you know P1, P2 for the different partitions. And again, those aren't gonna be, be there. So what we need to do is create them. And I've already done this, so I'm gonna show you this, but it's gonna tell me that all these things already exist and they can't do it, but that's fine because it's already done. So first thing you need to do is create a mount point. We're gonna go with our SD card first. I just need to make directory and I'm gonna mount them under the MNT folder. So make der MNT SD card. Boom, it already exists, not a problem. Next, we need to create the node. So we're gonna mknod, uh, and I'm gonna put them under my device folder because that's where they belong, and I'm gonna call them standard MMC BLK0 for the device, B1790 for the device, and then for the partition, uh, which I only have one partition on that card, I'm just gonna change these to, or actually that should still be zero, P1 for partition one. So we got, this device, the first device, and then partition one. Uh, and then next, all we have to do is mount that. But again, it's, it's already mounted, but we'll run that command. And then you'll have your SD card mounted. Same thing, we're just gonna go through all this right here. We're going to make a directory for my USB uh, drive. I just call it USB under MMT. Uh, make node, uh, and I'm gonna call it SDA. And uh, these numbers are different. We're gonna do eight and zero. And then for the partition, I'm gonna do SDA one, uh, eight and one for the first partition. And then you can go ahead and mount it at that location that we've created. Great, so we've created them and those devices will show up in your dev folder from here on out even after reboots, but they're not gonna automatically mount. So let's go ahead and look at what lines I've added to my F, F, FS tab folder. I'm sorry, file. So let's cat out etc uh, FS tab. 
And these are the two lines I've added. I'm going to mount my USB drive. Uh, I know that it's going to be a VFAT uh, partition. Uh, we've got the default 00. Same for the SD card. Now, there might be something I could put in here to make it auto mount, but I'm not, I need to get better at working with the uh, FS tab uh, file. So, um, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to add uh, my mount commands to my startup scripts here. So I'm, my screen recorder stopped there for a second, uh, but I was saying we're going to add uh, a line to mount our drives in our um, uh, our what you call it our uh, startup script. So uh, I'm going to use vi as the text editor because it's built into this device already. etc initd forward slash um, r C capital S. And then down at the very bottom here, you'll see that I've added a command to mount my SD card. And I don't need to tell it where I mount, want to mount to because the uh, FS tab file takes care of that. And then the USB flash drive I'm using is a very slow USB flash drive. And I'm assuming that's why if I just tried mounting it, it would not mount. I think it's just it hasn't detected that device yet. This is very sloppy. What I did is just add five seconds to the script. Um, so that's not the best way to do it, but it works. And it's the last thing in the script, so it doesn't really hang anything, except for when you're connecting through the serial port, it takes five seconds longer to boot. Uh, but I sleep for five seconds, and then I mount that drive. And then at that point, I can go into my MT folder, and you can see I have those, and I can, well, I can just do uh, list, SD card, you can see all the files and folders in there, and I can list out my USB folder, and you can see the files in there. In the next tutorial, we're going to be uh, upgrading our BusyBox because uh, Pogo Plug already has BusyBox on there, and actually a pretty full BusyBox with a lot of tools, but not all the tools. And why wouldn't we install all of the tools if we uh, if we if, if we can? Why not, right? Uh, so we'll we'll upgrade our BusyBox, and we'll also get a very simple HTTP server running using BusyBox, and a nice little index script I made for indexing your files. So that way, now you no longer are dependent on the Pogo Plug service. Um, you have your own little web server, uh, and you can contact it, connect to it through whatever web browser you want, and access your files. And that's what we'll be looking at in the next tutorial. I, uh, if you like this sort of stuff, I'm sure you found this video entertaining. If you don't, it was probably kind of dry, but I thank you for sticking around. And as always, visit filmsbychris.com. That's Chris with a K. There's a link in the description. And as always, I hope that you have a great day.